here we are, back again with the old oak tree, which is now fully in leaf. And now, I don't know whether you can see them, this field is full of sheep who spend the, the day sheltering from the sun under this tree, so the grass is all now trampled by the sheep, because this is pastoral farming country, deep in rural Somerset and we have the traditional English patchwork of green fields and hedgerow trees and hedges and little woods all over. And it's a working landscape, of course, that is created by farming. And I made a joke last time, which I think people misunderstood. When you live in the countryside, people think that it's probably very quiet. And it can be lovely and quiet, but it can also be extremely noisy because modern farming does involve large pieces of machinery. And particularly at this time of year, it's often really noisy. They're cutting silage everywhere and there's tractors racing around in fields mowing them and then there's big trailers full of silage thundering around up and down the lanes. And very often, we can get a bit frustrated with the farmers and so we have that joke farmers think they own the countryside and the point is of course that farmers do own the countryside it's not a criticism it's simply a witticism So I've been spending the last few weeks still working on the boat when I'm not doing other things and it's been mostly stuff that isn't really very filmable. I've been doing lots of little details and sorting things out and doing bits of work that I've been putting off for years in favour of going sailing. which bits of work that didn't seem very important but it's really nice to have had the opportunity to get them done now. I've also been enjoying spring in rural Somerset. In winter it's just dark and muddy and yes very muddy. Just at this time of year it suddenly becomes beautiful and fresh and wonderful and you remember why you live in the countryside. While we're up the hill here I thought I'd talk a little bit about the rural landscape. The point about farmland is of course that it is farmland and everything here that you can see, although it might be all beautiful and wonderfully English, it's all here for a purpose. This is a working landscape. The hedgerows that divide it up were put here to keep stock in. It, they're there because this is a pastoral landscape. It's a landscape for animals to be kept in fields and the hedgerows were there obviously to keep them in originally. Now every single hedgerow has a strand of barbed wire and the hedgerows are really kept largely actually out of sentiment. Farmers like to keep the farm going in the way that their grandfather ran it and their father ran it. And so the hedgerows were always there and so the hedgerows are maintained. They're no longer stock proof because nowadays hedgerows aren't laid in the old labour intensive way. They're just mown with a a flail mower on the back of a tractor. But farmers do do that and they go round and do it in every field. And it really is increasingly unnecessary. The hedgerows, from a farmer's point of view, don't really have a great purpose. But they did have a purpose and they, you know, farmers actually like to have an attractive farm. They're also, stock farmers are fiercely proud of their animals in a way that I think it may be really difficult for someone who isn't a farmer to understand. Stock farmers really are committed to their livestock. And you'll say that's impossible because they're just there to be killed. Yes, they are. But we're all here on earth 
for a short period and then we'll die. It doesn't mean to say we can't have a nice life in the meantime. There's a train going past now. There is actually a railway running across this landscape. It's one of the main lines of the Great Western Railway. So that's what that is. On the skyline there's quite a large area of woodland which is owned by the Duke of Somerset and that is managed for timber so it is there as a forest that grows timber but it's largely what it's for is actually cover for game. Shooting is an important land use in the countryside and virtually every little wood that's what it's for. Yes they're on unproductive land, they're on land that you wouldn't put crops on or you wouldn't actually put animals on but what the actual purpose they serve is for shooting and if you are against shooting which you may be I don't know you have to think what effect stopping shooting would have on the rural landscape because it would remove the reason for lots of these little woods and spinnies that you see in this landscape as so often, what you've got to do, I think, when you're thinking about the rural landscape and thinking about improving it, because there are problems with the rural landscape, you have to think about the people who live and work here and what they want as well, because I think it's really important that this is a landscape that's lived in by, and it's got lots of little family farms, and that society of farmers is something really precious and that we should keep and any changes that you might wish to make to the rural landscape have to be acceptable to farmers and you have to talk to farmers and you have to bring farmers along if you want to change things there is no point as so often happens people almost begrudge the fact that farmers farm the landscape and create our food and I I find that really un <laughs> I wish that were not the case I it, it is sad that particularly town folk have got very much isolated from the life of the countryside and food is seen as something that you just go and get in a supermarket and the way that our food choices affect the landscape I think it's just forgotten and I really do think it's forgotten the effect of food choices has on the life of the people who farm the countryside. For myself, I enjoy eating the produce of this landscape. I go and buy my milk from a local farm that has a machine. You can actually buy the milk out of a machine it's just in the next village and you have a bottle and you take the bottle and you put a pound in the machine and you get a litre of milk. And the farmer says it has transformed the viability of the farm, that he's actually retailing milk directly to his customers. There's a really good local butcher who will tell you where the meats come from. You can find out which farms, if you wish. You can find out how long the meat was hung. It isn't just like buying meat in a, in a supermarket. There is lots of cheese produced in Somerset, obviously cheddar cheese, world famous, but this is <laughs> local cheddar cheese, not New Zealand cheddar cheese or Australian cheddar cheese. There is local farmhouse cheddar and it is made in the old way and matured for ages, which gives it that deep taste. And that I enjoy eating. So for me, this landscape is not just a beautiful place to live, it also provides my sustenance and I really enjoy that and enjoy living here. People have been interested in my boxes. There were complaints about my um, previous aluminium coffee pot. So as you can see, 
I'm going to have a stainless steel one. I don't think these are any. better for you but they're easier to keep clean so and it shows that I respond to um, suggestions you're not ignored So today we're going to look at some of the questions I was asked and respond to them. There you are. You may remember last time we looked at anchors and I said I had replaced the chain on one of my anchors and I was going to replace both the shackles. Um, and so this is what I've done. I have ordered two new shackles. They have a little yellow pin which means that they're actually strength tested so they are actually four anchor chains and the great thing about galvanized shackles as compared to stainless steel ones is that if you really tighten them up they bind they won't come undone so you can be, feel secure that that's going to stay stay shackled and i just want to show you the other end of the five meters of chain. You'll recall we did this splicing last time. So various people on the comments, I do read the comments, said why didn't you put a thimble on here? Well I shall show you just now. So here we are in the boat with that anchor warp cleated on the port side and I can haul in and it comes in through the fair lead there's a galvanized fair lead on each bow one for each warp and eventually I get the chain and as you can see because we've got this nice splice it just comes straight in And then I'm hauling in chain. If I were to put a thimble on this join, the rope would jam in the fair lead and then I'd have to reach over and bring in the chain. I couldn't sort of haul it in through there. So as it is, I can actually haul the anchor right up to the bow. And that's really nice to be able to do that. So that's why, that's why a splice chain and rope together in the way I showed you last time. So you've seen me painting oars in the previous video. Here they are pretty well finished and this is just to give you an idea. That's how long a proper rowing oar is. My boat is 15 foot long and they're over 10 foot oars in uh, imperial measurements. Actually, I actually don't know how long they are in metric but there you are they're just barely shorter than the boat and that's the right length. Any shorter than that and rowing becomes really hard work and the reason people think rowing is hard work is that most people have poor quality oars and it is worth spending decent money on a decent pair of oars rather than an outboard and if you do that you won't use your outboard as I haven't on this boat since I first bought her I did use an outboard for one season and then once I got the decent oars I couldn't see any point. So I'll just show you the pumps under here there's an electric pump and there are two manual pumps there's one each side they're under the, the thwarts here and they discharge through the sides of the boat electric pump also there's only one electric pump it comes up here and through the side of the boat and they're obviously all under the floors I've taken this piece of floor out and uh, 
The electric pump is run from a big battery up forward that also runs the GPS chart plotter. The electric pump is automatic. You can leave it on and it runs every so often and detects whether there's any water, whether there's any resistance in fact, to its spinning. And if there is, it will then continue going until there's no longer any resistance. And that's when your, your boat's pumped out. This is the battery box. I've been painting the lid, but normally it has a rubber sealing strip around the top and it clamps down so it is actually waterproof. And in here there is a 70 amp hour leisure battery. I'd like a more modern solid state battery but this is lead acid, that's what we have at the moment. It lasts perhaps four days with heavy use and then I just go to a marina and, and recharge it. Under here is where we keep the anchor warps each side. just flake down into here, flake down into here, not coiled so they run out really easily when you want them. You just open the lid and then off they go and the end of the warp is tied in. People have asked what this is here. Aveldro is a centre border and so uh, there is a centre board case in here and the centreboard which is made of light alloy so it is slightly heavier than water but not terribly heavy controlled by two ropes one running through this cleat which holds it up it won't drop at the moment because it's on the trailer and another one here which you yank on to pull it down uh, I also in here there are some little hooks to put the um, elastic bungees that hold the, the little covers up for the uh, for where the anchor is down there so that's what that's all about it's they're led right back here so obviously I can hoist the center board up and lower it while steering I can reach all these from the helm remember these blocks these are for the tack down haul to tension the luff of the lug sail. Since we discussed them last time, I've wiped them over with linseed oil and Stockholm tar mixture, which uh, is what gives them this black lustrous finish. And I've also oiled them, so these now this now runs freely, which it wasn't doing when we were looking at it before, but that's what I do every winter. I've actually slightly altered the lead of these. I've moved the this cleat here down. It was on the gunnel and it's now down here, which was a little improvement I've been meaning to make for many years and and here we are, we've got round to it. Um, the funny thing's boat, you constantly refine them and change things and make things better. All the uh, splicings and whippings I paint with black paint. It's a bit like the way in an old boat you would tar them. It actually just helps the the splice or the whipping not to not to come undone. Down here in the bows, this bit of bottom board is screwed down onto lots of layers of insulation to act as buoyancy. And I'd never taken that up the whole time I owned the boat. It was still the original insulation and it was starting to degrade. I knew that because little bits of it kept getting in the bilges and then floating around. They, the, the bilge pump kept filtering them out so I had to uh, vacuum out the bilges every so often which was quite good because it stopped bits of polystyrene getting in the sea. But I've taken that up 
done a lot of work in, in the bows under there and then put new insulation in. So this is the, the old bit that had been uh, clearly a little creature had got in and made itself a little nest here. I always used to say you had to have long mooring warps in case you tied up to high key sides. And my mooring warps are a standard 15 metres long and even that's not long enough for a lot of key sides. But I'm finding increasingly I'm tying up to pontoons. Harbours are, are filling up with pontoons even if you avoid marinas. And so I decided it would be a good idea to actually have shorter warps fastened to the boat permanently and uh, that, that are suitable for a pontoon and then if I ever need to tie to a quayside I can get out a longer warp just for that. So I thought I'd put on four warps, one for each corner of the boat so they're always on the correct side and have them quite short and so here they are and the other byproduct of this is that I, I have a loop in the end so they can be very quickly dropped over a cleat if necessary but the length is set so that if I take it and hook it in the bows like that and I find myself in the water I can use it to get in it doesn't work desperately well doing it on the trailer, as you can see, uh, it gets a bit caught, but you can see the, the general idea. And so there's one of those each side now. My friend Mike, who does kippers, insisted that I show you his kippers. So that's what we're doing just now. You can't beat kippers. Why is he lighting a fire? You're probably thinking. Considering it's heading towards summer and it's getting warmer. And the reason is that my immersion heater has packed up because uh, this house, there is no gas in the village and I don't burn oil. I use electricity from um, Ecotricity's windmills and uh, I also have the ability to, to light fires and this fire has a back boiler and so I can have hot water People have asked about this range. It is probably just pre Second World War, 1930s. It's a foresight uh, made in Smedic in uh, Birmingham. I didn't put it in. It was it was here when I um, when I bought the house, and uh, it will have replaced uh, an iron Victorian range. All these ovens do work if you open various dampers. And I have cooked with it, but you realise that, uh, that cooking was quite hard work. 
in the old days when uh, when people were using these things. It's like driving a steam engine cooking on something like this. I live and work in a, in a, a farmed landscape. And it's a classic English landscape of green fields and hedgerow trees and little woods. There's lots of wildlife here. But yet it's threatened as, as the wildlife is in the whole British countryside due to various changes that are happening. And what is also happening is, is a debate about food. And I found often that, that debates about food seem to forget what the impact might be on the rural landscape. Many people find the idea that animals are raised for food and killed a difficult one. But this landscape around here, that's exactly what it's all about. All those little fields, all those hedgerows, they're there to keep the animals in. Crops don't need to be kept in. If you've got an arable landscape growing vegetables or grain for your vegan diet, it doesn't need hedgerows. Oh, you'll say, well, we'll have hedgerows anyway. We'll pass a law that people have to have hedgerows. Yeah, uh, best of luck with that. You go to, <laughs> go to a vegan landscape um, where they simply grow crops and grain and things. Uh, the East Anglian fens are probably a fairly good example. And you will find vast fields, very little wildlife and, yeah, lots of vegetables nicely sitting there being vegetables. So what I... The, the problem is that that sort of arable landscape doesn't intrinsically create a habitat for lots of animals. Meanwhile, this landscape around here does, it, and it does actually create a habitat as a byproduct for wildlife. Some of that wildlife is, is considered to be a pest and, and people try and keep it down. But nonetheless, it, there is a habitat for wildlife, all these little woods full of all sorts of creatures, deer gamble around the whole place. Maybe we should have wolves to keep down the deer. Um, that could be a very good idea. But then we've got to think about the fact that we also have sheep farmers and how are they going to fancy the idea of wolves wandering around taking their lambs. It's all rather complicated. But I actually think that very simple little changes can make the landscape work and make it a place where farmers have a satisfying life and a viable life, because that's what they want to have. They want to farm well and they want to obviously feed their families and create good food and, and have a... A, a decent amount of flora and fauna in, in the farm landscape. And I have to say, forgive me um, if you are a vegan or a vegetarian, I have to say that I don't think that that is the way that you would create the sort of landscape full of a wide variety of flora and fauna that, that, that I would like to see. I think it would be much closer to a sort of traditional mixed farming landscape where you have sort of crop rotations and so on. And that does mean eating meat and it means drinking milk and it means eating cheese and all the things that <laughs> we create in the landscape in which I live and which I'm very happy with. And and I think, if, as I say, uh, this is a really big subject. But if you want to change how we eat, you need to think about the people who live in the landscape at the moment and farm it and own it. Farmers own the countryside. And how 
these changes are going to affect them, I would suggest. And what can we say about the possible effect of Brexit and the possible effect of COVID-19 on, on the farm landscape? It, it can make you despair. But I think that there is a decent future if we all want to create it. And that future will have to accept that farmers own the countryside. But the message of this video is, that's fine. That's fine. Farmers are actually probably quite good people to own the countryside. Mm -hmm.